let, let's start with treatment. Um, subcutaneous DARA, did you make any DARA changes? Uh, I, I doubt you could do subcutaneous, but you, did you do anything differently with your DARA patients? Uh, why don't we start with Kevin? So, um, of course, uh, thanks to uh, the leading efforts that you made, Julie, uh, we, uh, you know, moved over to rapid infusion DARA fortuitously, uh, um, you know, towards the end of 2019, early 2020. So that was already in place. Um, we are also in a situation where we can move over patients to subcutaneous teratumab, and that's really for the Janssen study as, uh, studies, as Darrow uh, has been alluding to. And I think that's the right thing to do because, you know, the, the study shows that it's equivalent. And I can't imagine that they'll go back just because COVID, as you know, will probably be with us for at least another year and a half. So I think those are important changes uh, that, uh, that, have, that are happening. Um, I know that some centers have talked about, uh, um, you know, delaying DARA or not giving as much DARA, but certainly for our patients, we've been aggressive about continuing the DARA tomb uh, because, you know, you know, we are in a situation, as you've all kind of pointed out, where we're fighting two things. One is, the, you know, the condition that they have, the cancer, and the other is, you know, COVID and trying to mitigate uh, the risks related to COVID. So um, I think that we've just continued to try to be uh, uh, thoughtful about making certain people get the right treatment because as Daryl did mention, the people who tend to be prioritized are the ones who are curable. But at the same time, these are patients uh, with myeloma who maybe are not curable, but can live for a long time. And uh, um, you know, these treatments do uh, improve uh, their survival and quality of life. So, so I think we have to be thoughtful about that as well too. I do want to just say one thing about the trials before before uh, you pass it over to to Hira, and that's uh, um, you know the trials have been somewhat challenging in some ways, and you know this continues to remain a challenge as as I think a lot of the experience to, you know trials were halted uh, from various levels. So we've had trials where our institution initially said that we cannot enroll any more patients on trials because you know trials are not standard of care, and therefore we don't need to have more people in clinic. And then of course the companies then began to halt the trials or enrollment to their trials because they had issues particularly related to monitoring. You know, how, do, how do you monitor a trial when people can't get to the centers to do the proper monitoring? And now that's evolving as well too because this issue of virtual monitoring is coming up and uh, uh, that is uh, not necessarily something we can adjust to very quickly because with virtual monitoring, there has to be issues uh, that have to be addressed related to privacy and you know, platform that you use for virtual monitoring. So this continues to remain a struggle for us uh, at this time. And I think that uh, on the one hand, we're uh, you know, suffering from a product of our successes because I think most of us believe that clinical trials are pretty much standard treatments for patients with myeloma. They do lead to getting newer drugs sooner and prolonging life. Just before we moved on to here, do you want to comment at all on steroid reduction? Kevin? Oh, uh, sorry, sorry. I, 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 um, I thought you, you, you were speaking to here. So with steroid reduction, I think, um, um, you know, uh, uh, there was a lot of, the, you know, talks or recommendations about reducing the dose of steroids. I think for myself and my personal practice, I've always tried to reduce the amount of steroids quite quickly on my patients. Because nowadays, when we have patients who are living five, 10 years out, and with continuous therapy, you know, the steroid is a really big issue five or 10 years down the road with all the complications that they get with it. So I think that I try to keep it at the most effective dose level, meaning that I try to lower it uh, sooner rather than later. So I didn't really make huge adjustments on that. Here, how about you? Dara changes and steroid changes. Yeah, so I did not have the luxury of sub-Q DARA, and I am very um, envious of both Kevin and Daryl, and I don't know, Julie, if you had that option. <laughs> I, I didn't even know that was a possibility. We needed to talk earlier. Um, so at our site, what we did was for the new DARA starts, we as much as we could, we tried to delay them. So, you know, you were if you're starting on Revlimid and Dex, so try try to see if we can just do Revlimid and Dex and not have that long first day dura infusion as much as we could prolong it. But obviously there were scenarios where that could not be done. So the new starts, we, we tried to at least halt back, halt um, for a short time with a plan to add in dura when things were getting better. And again, in Ontario, we're allowed to do that. For the patients that were already on dura and stable, again, a lot of conversation about should we be holding doses and, and, um, what to do for the most part 
like Kevin and Daryl, you know, we at our site were still lucky enough that our chemo suite was up and running. So for the most patients, we did not switch them over at all. We continued the Velcade for all the transplant eligible patients. We did not switch them over to Xazimib. And similarly, the Daratumumab, we kept them on whatever schedule they were supposed to be on. Um, with regards to the steroid reduction, so again, I'm not, you know, uh, pretty conscious of it, bringing down the steroid dosing, but I think COVID was like a good reminder. Um, which made me think, okay, like, does this patient really need to be on this dose? Maybe I had meant to bring it down, but now is a really good to, time to bring it down. So I think, again, it just reinforced um, some of the practices we were doing, but I was somewhat bringing the steroid dosings down as well. Um, yeah, and I think as, as here mentioned from a Saskatchewan perspective, certainly we do not have subcutaneous daratumumab, but um, definitely do the rapid infusion. I, I think very initially, um, we tried to, to delay a month on everybody that was coming into clinic rightly or wrongly. Um, and so we did omit a, a dose or two for people. Um, and you're, you're right. I mean, it, COVID makes you rethink the way you do everything. I mean, we were still doing weekly blood work prior to bortezomib and, and certainly uh, have now put the kibosh on that one. Just wanted to ask everybody about their bisphosphonate um, uh, use now and where they think they're going in, in the future. Are you going to go back to once a month for a couple of years or do you think we can get away with every three months? Um, let's go to maybe Kevin first. Um, I think that's a really important question. I mean, it's not necessarily the most sexiest question, but um, I think that there's several issues with that. One is that, you know, when people are obviously, um, you know, newly diagnosed or have significant bony issues, I think I tend to be still somewhat aggressive about it. But if they're well and if they're very stable, then I think that every three, three months still makes sense. As you know, a lot of the studies that have shown improved survival are pretty old, and they were really before a lot of these uh, newer treatments are around, particularly the MRC study that I think uh, all of you know about. So I think that I would probably stick with every three months unless they have very, very aggressive bone disease um, and are symptomatic from it. Where one of the questions does come up is that um, I think that uh, uh, the use of denosumab, of course, because that can theoretically be given subcutaneously at, at home. And I think that question has been raised by a number of people. Now, I've not been uh, someone who uses a lot of denosumab just because the access to that uh, drug is very difficult here in British Columbia and, and uh, it's not funded. I don't know if it's funded in any other any jurisdictions. But also, you know, um, getting the, the drug to be administered is not necessarily straightforward you know a lot of these people don't necessarily know how to give it to themselves or may need to have somebody else come in to give it to them so um, that question has been raised but I have not been a very um, um, at least uh, um, um, big and in, in changing over to denosumab at this time. Interesting I, I actually hadn't heard about that or thought about that one. Um, just before I move on Martha thank you for uh, posting kind of your practice and what's happening at your institution and just to remind everybody on the line please Post your questions. Um, we can keep talking amongst ourselves and give give our opinions, but it's always nice to answer specific questions and make sure we're covering what you want to get out of the webinar. Uh, Daryl, any thoughts on bisphosphonates? So I, I generally do give, um, I guess my practice recently has been monthly for, for a couple of years and then typically restart on relapse. Um, it's interesting to, to go to every three months. I mean, that's what we were doing um, several years ago. Um, you know, I've for, forgotten exactly the timeline. You remember years and years ago it was monthly forever. And then um, we were doing every three months. Um, and I often was doing every three months forever. And then we switched to um, monthly for about two years or so. Um, I think my intention is to go back to monthly once, once we get back to whatever normal will be. Um, but uh, you know, like, like Kevin said, I think, I think for a newly diagnosed patient, it's probably important to get some doses of bisphosphonate in. Many of my patients are, have had myeloma uh, for years and years, and, you know, I'm dealing with relapsed, and I'm not as fussy there that um, somebody get, you know, again, a, a full two years, and the frequency probably doesn't really matter either. I think you're in sort of non-evidence-based territory for, for those guys. Um, hadn't switched anybody to oral. I don't, I don't actually don't think there's much place for oral bisphosphonate in myeloma. Here, I want to jump to you, but I actually just want to pick Daryl's brain for a second, because you mentioned the difficulty with interprovincial travel. I heard that actually in Newfoundland, and maybe you know, like we, they, they weren't allowed to give anything in, in the cancer clinic. 
um, intravenous to bring people in. At, is that still a situation there for them? I don't know, uh, Julia. Yeah, I'm not sure. I hadn't heard that actually. Um, I did talk to uh, someone from there on the weekend, and and they, I think they've been, um, you know, kind of business as usual recently. Okay. Um, and they 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 hadn't had a whole lot of cases of COVID. Like New Brunswick actually has been minimally NPEI minimally affected. Um, although really, you know, it, just like everybody else in the country not so much the number of cases in patients, perhaps outside of Montreal and Toronto, of um, COVID cases in patients with hematologic malignancy, more so the social uh, changes that we've had to make and the, and the changes in, you know, healthcare. I mean, we, we rapidly reduced the capacity of our hospital and, and um, you know, turn created COVID wards that for us, for the most part, went empty, but our, our emergency department was running at 40% and, you know, and, and the, Acute wards, uh, surgical and medical, were running at uh, you know thirty, forty percent. Um, hematology cooked along at one hundred percent as per usual. Um, so it was interesting to see. Here, what about you, Ms. Falsenates? So again, um, I usually do them once a month uh, up front, and then when the disease is a little bit more stable, I'm pretty comfortable routinely moving to moving them every three months. So certainly, we were not during this time allowed zoledronate really or any bisphosphonates at all. Um, and you would almost have to make an exception. So for some of the newly diagnosed, if they were getting the Velcade, I would just try to sneak in the zoledronate and then apologize later. Um, but for the most part, everyone else, I actually just entirely halted because it was in the grand scheme of things uh, for most of my stable patients, a small battle. Um, and I needed to get the, the uh, folks happy to get the transplants going. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, there's a question, just to go back to the whole steroid issue, uh, when you give a lower dose, um, I mean, I guess we can go to Daryl, what did you lower it yeah. than everybody else? What, what dose do you normally go to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, it, my, my usual dose is, uh, is 40 once a week for, for patients that are, you know, under 75 or, or at least fit and under 80. Um, and so, so to lower it, it's pretty much individualized. So, so, so I wouldn't hesitate to lower it to 20 once a week in somebody that's uh, relatively stable. Um, and many of my patients it came down lower than that. I don't tend to go to zero. Um, I know some do. I, I probably, you know, for, for me, 20 once a week is, is a relatively low dose remembering the days of uh, 40 milligrams, four days on, four days off. Uh, so it it, it seems pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Yeah, we used to use a lot more, but uh, anyway, there, we also I think like others, we there's also a shortage of dexamethasone uh, tablets yeah. uh, in the periphery at the moment. Um, so again, some people um, you you had to actually cut the dose or or plan to give them intravenous. Um, here you talked a little bit about it. Did you want to comment? Oh, no, I was, I was going to say, you know, in my practice, it's just, I, usually I go down to 20 once someone is stable. So I was bringing them down further, uh, mostly between eight and 12. Oh, whoa. Daryl, what so, do you think? <laughs> no, I don't have to answer so that. So for the you long, to, like for the very <laughs> stable <laughs> patients that have been on it for, again, for a long time, especially, you know, like with some of the, um, the previous like Revlimid and DEX data as well to say to come down on the DEX dose that was recently presented at ASH a couple of years ago as well. So I just felt comfortable. Again, I don't go down to zero. We actually can't go down to zero because then you're on Rev monotherapy and, and that's not really allowed because you need to be on Rev DEX. Um, so just bringing them down to a somewhat lower doses than I usually do. Kevin, any comments? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, uh, even before uh, the COVID, I used to have a number of discussions with my patients about lowering the dexamethasone, and, and it was partially precipitated by the patients as well, too. So I'm very comfortable, you know, continuing to march down on dexamethasone, you know, from, say, 20 to 12 to 8. And every once in a while, I will take off patients uh, from being on dexamethasone, and I do think it's reasonable. 
as here mentioned, there is some literature that's out there based on some Italian data. And, uh, you know, I, I think I've, I still feel that I see too many complications of patients have, having been on DEX for years and years and years. So, so uh, to the point that sometimes I don't know whether it's the myeloma or it's the DEX other than the fact that their light chains are not going up. So, um, so I do feel comfortable blowing down the DEX. And, uh, you know, the recommendations that are coming out of various uh, organizations say that it's reasonable to consider that as well, too.